I have with us today on our Conscious Fertility Podcast, Dr. William Bankston. Bill Bankston is a professor of statistics and research methods at St. Joseph's University in New York and the president, past president actually, of the Society for Scientific Exploration. And that's an international group of scientists who study anomalies. Dr. Bankston has been doing research into anomalous healing for over 40 years, which is why I invited him on to our podcast today. And he has numerous academic publications. His memoir, The Energy Cure, is published by Sounds True Publishers. He also lectures widely in the US, Canada, and Europe. And I have hosted Bill Bankston online as well on my platform. And I have had the privilege to attend his Bankston Healing Workshop in person as well. Now, his research has produced the first successful full cures of transplanted mammary cancer and methylcholathrene induced sarcomas, so tumors, in mice by energy healing techniques that he helped to develop, which we're going to talk to him about today. He's also investigated assorted correlates to healing such as EEG and fMRI entrainment and geomagnetic micropulsation anomalies in healing space. His current work involves the attempt to reverse engineer healing and reproduce healing without the healer. I want to welcome Bill to the show. And Bill, that last sentence, you're looking to reverse engineer healing and reproduce healing without the healer. I hope you're successful and I can retire as a healer and go back to my old career as a CPA, as a, as a professional accountant. Welcome to the show, Bill. Uh, I don't think you can blame me for becoming an accountant again. Yeah, it's, it's going to be on you. <laughs> No. <laughs> Thank you for the invite. The reason I wanted to bring you on for our conscious fertility talk, because your research is first of all on cancer. It's not on fertility. I wanted to have you on because there's so many people seeking healing, whether it's for fertility or other things, and your technique is unorthodox. And I thought that if we can let people know on one level that certain things that are told that can't be cured have been cured with an unorthodox method, then maybe more people will be interested in studying these methods of energy healing. I'm to see what else they can do and reproduce what you've done. And maybe we'll open up a whole new paradigm of how we can help ourselves heal. I strongly encourage people looking into the method and the technique and practicing and testing and see what works and what doesn't work. It's not a magical panacea for everything. It seems to do a lot of very interesting things with a lot of conditions. And an unexplored area, really, in terms of systematic lab work, has been fertility, which I think would be fascinating to look into. Can we start with what you have done with cancer? So can you share with the audience, what was the research? What did you do? What did you discover? And do you believe what you've discovered? Because it sounds like pretty out there, amazing results that you've gotten. Yeah, that's a lot. Uh, we only have four hours. <laughs> so a whole whole lot of years ago, I ran into a guy who turned into a healer without a teacher, and he fixed my back. Uh, I had a chronic bad back, so I, I would be uncomfortable or in pain a good chunk of the time. And he put his hands on my back, and it was the last pain I ever had. And this was confusing to me, to say the least, because I, I don't come to the table as a believer. I come to the table as, yeah, what do you got? Show me. Let's be skeptical about what you have and what you don't have. So I watched in the very beginning, and this is about uh, 90 years ago, I watched in the very beginning, this guy put his hands on people and get all sorts of interesting results. So some things work very fast, some things work not so much, some things work nah, we're not sure. And one of the interesting things was malignancies responded very, very, very well to this uh, healing technique. And b benign growths didn't. So if you have a benign growth and you try this healing technique, not so much happens. If you have a malignant growth and you try the healing technique, much happens. It's really like that. So I watched a few hundred people and trying to unravel well, what was happening in the clinical cases, and it was getting way too complicated. You know, so if, if you have someone comes in and they have whatever they have, you know, they, they come in with X condition and they, they get treated with hands on or hands near or hands off or they get treated and they get better. What did it? I, I don't know whether it was time and they were going to get better anyway. I don't, don't know whether it was something they ate, something they didn't eat. You, you simply can't, or at least I can't figure out how to unravel this stuff clinically. So I took the stuff into the lab and um, in, into a lab, we can control the environment to control the dose and control the lifestyle, if you will, of whatever it is that we're studying. And so you're trading off you start out looking at the real world, you go into the lab, which is an unreal world, and then you hopefully, at the end of that, you go back to the real world. I started to look into a nice model 
that everybody knew about. And, and one of the things I came across was a particular form of mammary cancer, and it's probably the most studied oncology question out there. There are literally thousands of, of published papers and peer-reviewed journals on a particular mouse model of mammary cancer. And among the things that, that we care about here is that 100% of the mice will die if they're injected with a particular cancer, a particular amount of cancer in a particular way. And so thousands of experiments are done, have been done, published about, and all of the mice always die in a month. No mouse has ever la lasted past the mouse. Uh past a month. And so what I do is I take something that's already known, quite well understood, or certainly quite well experienced, and I interject a new variable, single variable, simple variable. What happens if you take a mouse model and you do everything the normal biological way, which means the mouse is going to die in a month, and you interject healing. And so we interject healing, and what we find is strange stuff occurs when you interject healing into a cancerous mouse. Tumors, instead of continuing to grow, have a tendency to ulcerate. They they look ugly. The mice don't seem to be bothered in any way, shape, or form. The tumors implode and the mice are cured. It's not a remission uh, because it doesn't come back. It's not a suppression of symptoms. It doesn't come back. The mice are cured for their entire lifespan. And more than that, if the mice are re-injected after they've been treated, they can't get cancer again. And so that becomes a nice model to study because we know it's supposed to happen. I come along and screw things up. And then we find out what happens when you enter with that with that single variable. So what we found, way, go ahead. I was just going to say for your research then, I just got to repeat this because you've said it so kind of casually. To me, this is kind of like, what? Seriously? You've taken mice, you've injected them, causing cancer. This is not you having created, uh, invented this idea. This is done in research where they invent mice Routinely. with cancer to study, to study cancer. Yep. Um, and they always die. And you go in and you have this healing technique, which we're going to get into. And this healing technique, these mice are cured, meaning the cancer goes away and they're immune to it. When you inject the mice again with the cancer causing agents, they don't get cancer. And this has been published. So this is an anecdotal. And this study has been done at numerous med schools and it's been reproduced numerous times and people can go and look at this research. I think we have six medical schools and three other independent biology labs looking at this. It's been published all over the place. You can read some of my technical publications at bankstonresearch.com. So there's, I don't know, maybe 25 or 30 papers on, on reserve there that if you want to look at geeky things. But what, you're, what you just summarized was essentially what happens. And I've just finished finished in Tokyo my 19th and 20th mouse experiment. <laughs> so the, the, the research goes on. What we find is that it's no longer interesting a question to say, do you think healing is real or do you think it has potential or something along those lines? It's not an interesting question anymore. Healing happens. And the question is, how do we uncover its process? How do we uncover the thing that stimulates it the most? What are the, what, where can we take this? And, and so we've, we've looked at what happened happens to the healer, what happens to the healee. We've hooked people up to EEGs and functional MRIs. We've hooked up all sorts of probes and put them in the room and looked to see if there's changes in the physical space. We've tested to see if distance matters, what does belief matter. You know, you can just keep going on and on, but no longer is it interesting this healing happen. In a summary, can you tell us what happens to the healee, the person receiving, and what happens to the healer, the person who's tending or giving the healing? The healer and healee, what we have is is I use already existing tools and toys and stuff that you'd find in a lab. And when I do EEG work or I do functional MRI work, we have a tendency to build toys that looks at the brain. Uh, we have a brain fetish. And so we, we don't have an equivalent anything to look at gallbladders. So we don't have something to look at a pancreas. So we can measure in some detail stuff that's going on in a, in a head because we think the head's important. And so we've made all sorts of uh, gimmicks and gizmos that'll look in to what's going on. I just apply that to healing. And when I have a healer and I have a healee, even if they're separated by some distance, their brains go into essentially entrainment. They start to resonate together. So the two brains move together. The hearts go together. The hearts go into entrainment. So our heartbeats will entrain regardless of distance and our brains will entrain regardless of distance. And that goes on without anybody trying to do that. Simply the act of healing and the act of a healee 
wanting to be healed, not believing, just wanting to be healed, uh, seems to set up an entrainment uh, pattern of some sort. And that, that's worth continuing to look. We don't know what else is, is involved in the entrainment. So again, brains go into entrainment, hearts go into entrainment. We have toys that look at hearts and we have toys that look at brains. I think we probably find similar stuff if we looked at gallbladders. Probably gallbladders sink and livers sink and all that stuff sinks there's a connection then that's happening between the healer and healy you're not separate then you there is something happening that with our five senses, we may or may not observe. And I say that in the sense that some people aren't aren't sensitive, or I should say some people are super sensitive that they may feel it. But with this sensitive equipment, you are able to least measure in the brain and the heart that there is a connection or connectivity happening between the healing and healer. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, absolutely. And it's you're exactly right. It's not a question of going down the street going, oh, Bankston is thinking of me now, you know, I, and that would be a pathology in and of itself. <laughs> So what you have, it's not a conscious thing any more than if I hooked something up to, I, get, I hooked up an EKG and you went from 70 to 72 beats a minute. Most people, unless they're obsessed with their heart, wouldn't know that that had occurred. If there's a change in an output of the brain, you don't know that that occurs and you're not trying to do it. So this isn't an effort to get in sync with someone else. Getting in sync with someone else happens as a result of wanting to heal. So this leads me to some questions around the method. now. When we trained together, when I took your workshop, and again, I've done this time of this recording twice, it's like a four-day process of learning your technique and practicing your technique. And so we're not going to do that today on our podcast because we're not going to put four days into uh, under We can hour. talk very fast. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. <laughs> However, I do want to unpack kind of the my understanding of this process with you. So with the Bankston Energy Healing Method, there is a key component to it that you you call image cycling. And I would like us to talk a little bit about it. And when I was learning it and reading about it, it reminded me a lot of manifestation processes. And that's really of interest to our listeners because in conscious fertility, a big part of our discussion is baby manifestation. How can you receive life on purpose? How can you use your intention to help optimize your fertility, for example. So would you describe your image cycling as a form of manifestation or as a technique for manifestation? Yeah, it, and, and it's interesting. A, a whole bunch of people have told me that I have a manifestation technique <laughs> and, and I wasn't trying to create a manifestation technique. It just kind of stumbled upon it. And I guess it is a manifestation technique in the sense that there seems to be an interesting coincidence about the things that you want that you get when you do this technique. I can't call, say, X causes Y, you know, that that's crazy talk, but I'll just say it's, an, it, I, I got to be pretty conservative about the stuff I claim. It's, it seems to be a pretty good man, you know, in those terms, once I wrap myself around man, what manifestation might mean, I would say, yeah, it's probably ought to be considered a manifestation technique. In your image cycling technique, you encourage people to come up with a list, you know, see how many people, see how many images um, you can create. And these are things that people, it can be about health, because, you know, what are the things that people want? money, health, um, wealth, you know, love, relationships. And in this this technique that you, you share and teach, in my experience, it's simple, but not easy. And I yeah. say simple that anybody can learn it, but it's not easy, right? <laughs> like, it's not like I want, I get. <laughs> yeah. You have to practice this technique. It, it's, it's a mastery. Yeah, my techniques are pretty annoying. As you say, they don't just, you don't master it in five minutes, you know, kind of a thing. It's a practice, which means a practice means you keep going and you keep practicing. And you see, where it, where it leads, but it is it is somewhat effortful. And I, I'm told there are manifestation techniques out there that you can manifest anything instantly, you know, yada, yada, yada. They're better than me if they can do that. This isn't magic. It's something that's researchable, something that produces interesting phenomena. You know, I've taken up a, a whole bunch of lab time trying to get to the bottom of what in heaven's name does this thing really do, you know, and it's, it's pretty interesting. This is where I'm curious because in your energy healing technique, the healer does this technique called image cycling, and then they intend the healing. And, and that, that seems to be, I'm simplifying it, but that's kind of the what it looks like from inside outside observer. And I get curious for our listeners because you could just do the image cycling for yourself if you're looking to manifest stuff like, again, your fertility, a baby. And so that's my first step is just, I know you have no data on this. So I, I got to clarify, Dr. Bankson has lots of data on this technique for cancer. And, uh, and and some other stuff. 
And, but, and yeah. other stuff. What are some of the other stuff? But we don't have it on reproductive health at this point. We don't, we don't have it on reproductive health. You'd probably be better off just leaving it there that I, I don't know, you know, really an outcome. I can't, I don't have a predictable outcome for reproductive health. Though there's a handful of folks who have used this for that that I'm aware of. And anecdotally, interesting things seem to have occurred. And so with this imaging cycling, this, what I'm saying is like a manifestation technique because I've incorporated concepts of it in my manifestation process. I think it would be interesting to see of using it because I don't see a downfall. I guess that's my point because if you have a list of things that you want to manifest, you want them. So if they manifest that you're happy, they've manifested. Anecdotally, I'll share with you that after we did our workshop together, I did my list and I practiced it. And I know two things in a very reasonable amount of time, not a long time, manifested. I always, when um, Elon Musk came out and said he had the Tesla Model Y coming out, it wasn't built yet. I wanted that. And then <laughs> after doing your technique, the car still wasn't being delivered yet, but I knew they were go they were making them. I was like, geez, I, I would really love that Model Y. And so I used your imaging. That was one of my images in it. And I won't share how, what we do with it. That's a fun process to learn. But I, I used the cycling technique for that as part of my manifestation. I have another company that I wanted a, a certain sum of money in the bank account for it. Not a reasonable amount either. It wasn't something I thought I could get. And lo and behold, I have the Model Y Tesla in my driveway and that amount appeared in my bank account. I, things happened and I was like, hey, all right, this is pretty cool. That's why I'm thinking that if you're doing this technique, regardless if everything on the list does not appear, if you get some, you're still going to be pretty happy that some of those things on your list appeared. So I I, I don't see a downfall in practicing this technique. No, I don't either. Other than it's annoying. <laughs> it is annoying, you, yes. you, you, you don't You don't wave a magic wand and everything is done. It teaches a little bit of self-discipline too because you, you mentioned some everybody wants, you know, everybody wants and they want to be happy and they want to be healthy. And the image cycling has nothing to do with vague generalities like that. So your example is a good one as, a, as distinct from being happy. You know, so everybody says, I want to be happy. Well, it, that has no meaning. It has no recognition recognizable goal. If suddenly I'm happy Tuesday, does that mean I've achieved happiness and now I'm happy, you know, in perpetuity? Or are you sometimes happy, sometimes not? You know, so it's same thing is true incidentally with health. If you say I, I just want to be healthy, well, I don't know what that means. Does that mean there's no aches, no pains? Does that mean there's no bugs? Does that mean there's no viruses? Does that mean there's you know it, it doesn't have a meaning. Everybody's got something. Everybody goes up and down in terms of their emotions. Everybody goes up and down in terms of a lot of things. We don't deal with things that are vague generalities like happiness and health. We deal with very concrete things that you should be able to observe or not observe. So you want a Tesla and the question is, do you have a Tesla? Well, I can recognize whether you have a Tesla a whole lot differently than I can. Can you recognize when you're happy? You're happy. Eh. I mean, I don't know what happens, but Tuesday you got a Tesla and Tuesday it's sitting in the driveway. Uh, this technique deals only with recognizable testable, if you will, observable phenomena that you would want, such as, I want a Tesla, I want a kid. You have a kid, you don't have a kid. It's not, you know, I, I just want to be happy and go around with a big smile on my face. Did I get the kid? Did I get the Tesla? Did I get the money in the bank? Did I get the whatever, whatever it may be? But it's observable. It would be visualizable, as, as it were. You can visualize the Tesla and you either have it or you don't. And it's an important piece that you share there because in studying different manifestation techniques, Techniques, including yours and how I do it in my practice, being specific is key. Vague is not good. Like it doesn't work. And I speculate, I don't know, I, I can't, I could not confirm this with data, but I speculate that we're imprinting something on the subconscious. I don't know. How, how could I, I don't know how to measure that, but that's how I try to make my brain understand it. And just to talk about the Tesla, since we got onto the Tesla and we'll get into the fertility side of it a, a bit as well. But when I was imagining a Tesla, and why does somebody want something? Because they think they, they want it because I think it's going to make them happy, right? But as you said, being happy is too vague. So I had this Tesla image and in it, I could feel the steering wheel. Like I had all the senses going. I could smell the new smell on the car. I could feel what it drove like when I was in the seats. I could feel the steering wheel. And for some reason in my imagination, Bill, I washed my car a lot. I imagined myself washing my Tesla. And just as you're saying this, what's funny, I just realized I wash my Tesla a lot. Um, <laughs> so much so that I, I realized my neighbor came over to me and said, you really love that car. And I go, why do you think that? He goes, because you're always washing it, <laughs> right? 
right? And so, so there's something I'm pre- I didn't even realize I was always washing it. When I say wash it a lot, like <laughs> once a week, I wash the car, right? It's a meditation. Like literally when I wash it, it's just a meditation. I sit there, I got some headphones on, and I take my time, I'm washing it, drying it, and it's an enjoyable experience for me. Yeah. But that was part of my, when I was practicing my manifestation for the Tesla part, that's what I was doing. And so I just wanted to share that part as Bill says, you just can't say, I want to be happy. It has to be specific. And then I want a Tesla. Well, you got to communicate to, I don't know what we're communicating to. I call it the subconscious, but you got to imprint it. And there's different techniques that Bill teaches in his programs on how to do that. So just thought I would share that little story because it just dawned on me that I use washing my car as part of my process in my image cycling. And I realized I wash my car a lot (laughs) now that I actually have it so much so that it's bothering my neighbor that he sees me wash it all the time. They had to make a comment. You love that car almost like it was like a judgment you're yeah. loving that car too much because you're washing it too much well, he was probably offering you a 12-step program to stop washing your tesla exactly <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've lost the power to control my my tesla <laughs> and so for those that have listened or listened to some of the podcasts i have on baby manifestation it's we always ask the question when i see my patients one-on-one is why do you want the baby as in what's it going to bring to you what feelings how will you know that the baby's arrived how will you be different how will you feel differently and then bring in the experience of the baby like if somebody wants a baby and they want a new car i think you shared with me off camera off audio you're saying like there's a car seat in the in the tesla or a car seat in the porsche right so this is the big big part of this process that i invite people to look more into now we mentioned how this is an annoying technique you said like it's annoying it it, it takes practicing mastering memorization it's not like i want i get there is a process to it it's simple anybody can learn it but it is not easy that's why not everybody is disciplined to learn this technique the question i have which i'm a bit curious about is you had many healers it wasn't just you in your research do the healing on the mice which means they had to learn this image cycling technique and i think in your research and it was either in your book or in your workshop you shared that a lot of these people were not believers they thought this was nonsense they didn't want to do this is that that correct like you got some people that were kind of skeptics that were just like this is silly for me having to do this, hold my hands over a cage of mice. Yeah, they, I handpicked the people who took part in, in replication of this stuff, and I have a tendency only to pick skeptics just because I myself am a skeptic. I, I don't default to belief. I test. I find out. Am I thinking about things the right way or, or not? Believers have a tendency not to be open to new things, and regardless of what they believe, because they spend most of their time reinforcing their own beliefs and trying to make sure that you know their beliefs win, you know, kind of kind of a thing. So believers come in various flavors. Uh, One can be, if we're talking about my stuff, a believer could say everything he's saying is true. That's a believer. And another form of believer is everything he says is wrong. And so if you come at this already knowing that I'm wrong, you're a believer. If you are are coming at this thinking everything I say is right, you're a believer. A skeptic is someone who says, eh, I don't know. Let's find out. Let's test. Let's be open. We don't have a a skeptic will tend not to have the arrogance to know everything about the way the world works. So I want to play a bit of a skeptic. So I'm not a believer or non-believer. And I have a question for you that if these individuals were skeptics, meaning they weren't like gung-ho to do this technique of image cycling while intending healing to these mice um, in a cage, hands around the cage, how did you get them to learn? learn this technique because I wanted to learn how to do manifestation and I wanted to learn how to incorporate this, which I have into my practice for healing. I was motivated. I wanted to do it. And man, it was hard to learn this technique. I still think I, I'm lousy at it, to be honest. Like I don't know how to tell if I've mastered it or not, except for, hey, I got a Tesla in my car and I my bank account, <laughs> my bank account says that. I still think I can't do it, but I'm like, oh, I got that. I got that. So the question I have is how did they do it? Because if I was a skeptic and I was recruited to do this study and I had to put all that effort in, I may say, you know what, Bill, I'm not interested in being in your experiment. This is too much work. How did you get them to do it? Can you actually measure that they're doing image cycling? The answer to the second question is simple. No, I don't have a cyclometer. I don't have a helometer. I'd I'd love to. I'm actually working on uh, different experimental models to see if I can come up with a helometer or a cyclometer that's nice and simple and reasonably reliable. Uh, So far, I have to say I don't have one that fulfills 
fulfills all my, my requirements. But how did I get them to do it? I approached people based on just a gut feeling, like here's someone who seems to be interested in the world. When I would speak to someone, if they had a history of knowing or reading about healing, I excluded them from my subject pool because I didn't want people, again, who are believers who are trying to fit whatever I'm doing into whatever they think the, the world works. And so I would go up to people say, I, I've been working at this study on healing, this, that, and the other thing. And if I, if I got this wide-eyed response like, come on, really? What are you talking about? Then I'd say, okay, well, maybe we have a candidate here because they 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 want. What am I talking about? Well, they're, they're interested. They don't believe the stuff, but I sit down. And I say, here's the deal: you're going to have to work for a whole bunch of weeks practicing an annoying technique, and then we're going to give you a cage of cancerous mice. And then and they look at me like, come on, really? What do you want me to do? A good number of my subjects, not coming from a background of being a healer or studying healing, have actually thought that I was doing studies on them in gullibility. <laughs> you know, you think we can get anybody to believe anything, you know, so so a lot of them got, a, got cages of mice, cured the mice, and then got real upset because they didn't believe the stuff. And so a handful of people have done it more than once. Most people have only done it once and they get scared and run away. You know, the scared and run away thing is interesting. You're talking about the healer. I want to talk about the healy. There's a two-part setup for this. One is interesting that when people come for conscious work in my practice and we do, and I use this term baby manifestation loosely, they start off with they want a baby. So we go through the process of, you know, what does the baby represent and how would you know if you have it? So there's a whole, what I call subconscious work or energy psychology, conscious work. Interesting is by like the third session, they're not even focusing on the baby. Actually, it's funny how they're working on other things. It's interesting how that happens. But by the fourth session, I would say more people run away than stay in my practice. So they're having some cool results. And then there seems to be like a freak out. They either yeah. don't come back for a while. They come back often, but not for a while. They stop in the middle of it. Or when they come in for that fourth or fifth session, they say, you know what? I'm really tired today. Can we not do the conscious work today? Can we just do a relaxation session? I remember Remember you alluded to this as well. Do you see people like freak out when your healers are doing the healing? If I can use that correctly, like what happens to the healy in your research and anadoli? Do people freak out often? Yeah, I would agree with you that a good chunk, I don't know what the fraction would be, but a good chunk of people, they start getting better for whatever they have and they run away. They get scared. This is among the reasons that I ended up going into the lab. Mice don't run away. The people run away. So someone will come show up and say, could you treat me or fix me or whatever it might be. And if they've come to a healer, they've probably failed in a whole variety of other approaches. So they've gone with traditional folks in white coats and that didn't do it. And then they go and do a different color coat and then they, and then they, and then they, and then they, and then you're, you're exhausting all possibilities. And when you get to the bottom of the barrel, you go, well, let's try a healer. <laughs> now, what happens if the healer heals? That's not necessarily anticipated. And frankly, there's a, my experience without putting a number on it is that a good chunk of people, by the time they get to going to a healer, they're already chronically ill with something. And they have a tendency to become comfortable with their chronic illness. And if someone comes along and takes it away, that can actually be experienced as a loss. I started out, I need whatever it is healed, healed. And now I'm, I've been running around now for years and now suddenly maybe this thing works what if this thing works and their world is thrown upside down mice happily come back get healed they're happy i get a thank you card from them and they move on so cultures do the same thing people are confounding <laughs> you know it's interesting though because that you're saying this and thank you because when you're seeing people make some progress early and through their self-reporting or things that they can measure objectively and then they stop i used to take it personally like man you know i just what's going on here it's interesting to hear that this is something that you experience and we don't know why, but we can speculate or think. And as you said, there's a loss. And I think once shared that people become identified sometimes with what they have yeah. and, and to take it away, it's uncomfortable. And I don't think it's a conscious thing. This is why I always like to use the term loosely. It's your subconscious programming that's that self-sabotaging. And again, not as a judgment or criticize. I do it all the time. When I see an outcome, I'm curious where that program was running that I was not obvious of it. Why is it subconscious? 
well, because I didn't know it was running. If I, if I knew it was running, it would be conscious. Yeah. And they come to my practice, they come to listen to the podcast, or they come to, to you, Bill, because consciously they want something. They think they want something. Yeah. But then there's another program running that says, maybe not. Yeah, what happens if, if I'm fixed to this? So I can give you some extreme cases, uh, just for the purpose of illustration. I had one person, when I used to do people, now I farm them out to people who've taken my workshop and trained. It's, it makes my life a whole lot easier. I can play with rodents and they get to play with people. <laughs> I got the better deal. Right. Anyway. You, I, I invite them to persevere lightly. And the reason is, is I have a bias. They're paying me for the healing, right? I have a practice. And so yeah. I feel there's a conflict for me to be forceful to say, push through. But if they're listening to this podcast, which is free, and you're seeing somebody that's doing conscious work, manifestation work, or a healing technique, and you're feeling like you want to run with no good reason. Sometimes there's a good reason to run, but like for one is if they say they have a hundred percent cure rate, often that's a good person to run from. Often, not always. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I can fix but, anything instantly. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Run. You know, when you just feel like I don't want to go or I'm tired or you have all those excuses, reconsider. It would be my suggestion because you may be getting in your own way of what you want. Subconsciously. Yeah, and, and healing can be traumatic. Uh, we, we had a patient uh, a bunch of years ago who was severely, 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 severely depressed. And all medications had failed and they were basically sat around staring and did this for decades and couldn't get them out. And I was brought patient like this by someone I knew who's a clinical psychologist said, we've tried everything, just nothing seems to work. And they've basically been staring for a couple of decades. We did the treatment and the person no longer is staring and came out of it and became excited with life. And But now it's 20 years later. You know, that's traumatic. You know, it sounds wonderful. Oh boy, you did a long-term depressive and what, what happened to your life? You know, and what happened to you go from sitting in the corner, not doing anything to now suddenly you're, the world is interesting to you, but now it's a different year. I don't know how to fit anymore. If you're staring in the corner, you have a role. If you're jumping up and down, you have a role. If you're a taxi driver, you have a role. But what does this person have a role doing? You know, so it was, it's not necessarily, oh, that's fun. Isn't that wonderful? They got fixed. Yeah. Yeah, but there's there's more to it than that. You got to integrate them back. The reason I like your energy healing technique is the big part of it is the image cycling, which I believe is a manifestation technique. So you don't have to be interested in healing others. You could just do the image cycling technique as a technique to manifest. Yeah, the cycling is a way of life going around. I mean, as you say, what's the downside? You get stuff you want and you can change your list to make whatever you want. Rub the, the magic uh, lamp and, and you get another wish. It's not too shabby a deal. It's not a healing technique, but the technique can be used to heal and people who heal should be doing the technique. We think it matters. I'd like to ask you a few questions if you're willing to share about the image cycling technique. We shared, it's not easy. It takes effort. It takes a lot of practice. You said it's annoying, not me, but it's, it's an <laughs> annoying technique. It's annoying. What do you think or say for people that don't want to do it because it's too much work? What's your thoughts on that? Because you come across that, I'm sure, in your workshops or that may be sure. somebody's response. How do you respond to that? Yeah, if you don't, if you don't want to do it because it's too much work. It's simple to me. Don't do it. I'm not on a mission to save the world. If you want something for yourself, this seems to be a pretty good way to do stuff, you know, and incorporate it into your life. After an initial attempt to learn it, you know, with all its frustrations, it gets easier over time. And just as you learn any new skill, it takes practice. Again, you don't snap your fingers, everything is done. The question to me, to my ears anyway, is absolutely identical if you said, I'm responding now to Wimbledon going on. So I, I want to play tennis and I want to play tennis at Wimbledon. Okay, that's a specific goal. You either do or you do or you don't. But I guarantee you, you're not going to pick up a racket and manifest a Wimbledon appearance in a day. You're going to have to learn a little bit. You're going to have to practice a little bit. You're going to say, but I don't want to practice. Okay, well, you're not going to make Wimbledon. <laughs> it's just, it's not going to happen. So you have to decide, what do you want? Do I really want to learn how to play tennis? In which case, you're going to put in some time. Hopefully, you'll have fun when you're doing it, but you're going to put in some time. If you want to learn image cycling, you're going to put in some time. Not as much as going to Wimbledon, but you're going to put in some time. If you don't want to play tennis, don't play. If you don't want to manifest stuff using this technique, don't do it. It's been part of my experience when people come. That I think some of the impression is I'm going to come and Lauren will wave his arms around me, a couple acupuncture point needles, a little bit of low-level laser therapy, and boom, everything's done. Yeah. 
Do um, magic. But, do magic. And I, I send them home with homework. Like there's things they got to do. I'm the guide, right? I'm giving them the tools, but they have to master the tools. That's where I, I share a lot of people fall off. It's easy for everybody to start. It's like a marathon. Anybody can start a marathon. Can you finish the marathon, right? That's the challenge. And you need to usually have to uh, train yeah. to finish that marathon. But anybody can sign up pretty much and start a marathon. And, and different so, people come up with different ways to, to keep going. So there's practice groups. There's people, you know, self-help groups that get together and do this stuff amongst themselves. And, you know, so that, that works for some people, not for others. I used to take it personally again, like how, you know, my program, like I'm not good enough or how I'm failing you know, not doing it well enough for them. Like I'm not inspiring them enough. And, and then I remember something you had shared with me that, you know, if they're not interested in learning this technique, then you're not interested in them. They have to be interested in it. And uh, I've once heard the saying that in healing anyhow, and that they have to want it more than you do. The, you know, the healer has to want it more than the healer in a sense, meaning they got to be able to be ready and willing to do the work because the healer is not going to be able to do, the healer is not going to be able to do the work for them so much in this cycling technique. Anyhow, you're going to have to be the one to practice. And in my style as well, I'm not one of those gifted people where I can shake my fingers and you get what you want. I can teach you how you can shake your fingers, but you're going to have to go and practice that technique. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that part. So this may be a fun thing. I'll invite you on the air here. You and I, we've had you online before, but could I interest you in a cycling image, an image cycling technique for baby manifestation to teach people how to do the image cycling technique and with the intention that we know that a lot of the, the audience are going to be people interested in manifesting a baby. I think we can open it up to anybody, Bill. We can, people want to manifest whatever they want in their life. It's just to learn the cycling, the cycling technique. Is that something that we can talk off air and then let people know at a later date? Well, I, I think I, I don't need to be off air for, for the idea. The idea is a good one. And the reason it appeals to me is, is because you have a, a concrete outcome that you want. We can know whether we're successful or not and we can image it. And we, we really do want it, you know, so presumably the participants would having some difficulty with fertility. They don't want the difficulty in fertility. And the ones that do want the difficulty in fertility will drift away. But the, the, the ones who really want to, to overcome fertility problems, we can image it. We could cycle it. I think it'd be interesting for, to, to play around with. Excellent. So we'll talk more about this and then you'll check the podcast notes and hopefully we'll have something on there to direct you to learn more about that as, as well. Any closing remarks around just the Bankstein healing method? Anything you want to share from your vast research about energy healing, about manifestation or image cycling? Where is the research going? What are you doing now? What can we look for with respect to data? Well, the, the stuff I'm doing now is concentrated, though not exclusive. It's concentrated on trying to reproduce the healing without the healer. So there are inexhaustible supplies of people who need help out there. And regardless of what they need help with, so they have pain, condition, a disease, something missing, you know, who knows. And even if we train a bunch of people to do hands-on or hands-near or hands-around healing, there's going to be more of a, there's just too many people out there. And so I want to move healing from something unconventional, and it's clearly unconventional, to something that's conventional. And if it's going to be conventional, it has to be able to be reproduced and it has to be able to be mass produced. So the questions I have are, can healing be stored in material? And the short answer is yes. So I've got a variety of experiments that healing can be stored. Healing can be recorded and healing can, the playback of that recording will produce really interesting phenomena. And again, I have academic papers, which are kind of geeky, but you'll, you'll see, for example, in an experiment in recording healing, we've looked at 167 genes and found reliably 68 genes change if exposed to a healing recording. And cancer cells will change genomically if we play to them a healing recording. If we play to them a recording, we get something. If we charge material like cotton or we charge material like water, we get interesting healing phenomena. And the, the question is, can we make this so elegantly storable that it becomes scalable? A recording is scalable. We, we could upload, if I ever get the technology down, and I've made some progress, if I ever get the technology down, I could upload a healing recording into the cloud. You download it if you want to be treated. Then people are going to flock to it. They're not going to be scratching their heads and wondering about this and confusing healing with, I don't know, some spiritual practice or something along 
along those lines. It's healing. It's a natural phenomenon. And the question is, can we d- understand the patterns? You know, we said we're closing off here, but I, I have, you just said something that I'd love some clarification. First of all, what you just said is both kind of op- um, exciting, but also makes my brain hurt. Recording, yeah. he- you can record healing. You can, yeah. And we're not, we don't have the time to get into that discussion, but we got to have you back to talk about that because it, it makes my brain hurt because that's kind of way outside how we understand science and everything today. However, I know you guys have data. So I always say, you know, there was uh, lots of smart people who thought the world was flat. And then some, a few people came around saying it was round. And I think a few of them were killed for that thought and that idea. And now today we just cancel them. We don't physically kill them. (laughs) We just cancel them. But, you know, look at the world's change, right? And so being open-minded, I'm curious. I have to say it seems unbelievable. So can't wait to see see this data. (laughs) You know, it seems, look at this data. But you talked about it's healing. It's, It's nothing spiritual. Can you touch a bit about that? Because a lot of the healers or people go to healing, there is a lot of ritual, spiritual, even religious connotation around it. And I don't get that from how you share your stuff. It's kind of like it's gravity. It's just there. There's no gravity. spiritual part gravity, of it. It's yeah. just healing. So do you want to talk on that for a moment? Yep. Yeah. The question about spirituality is is an interesting one. And for some reason, healing is conflated with spirituality. I, I'm not a spirituality expert. I don't know what it means. So I can tell you that it doesn't seem to make any difference what you believe when you're healing. It matters that you do it. You know, I don't say I believe in tennis. I play tennis. I don't say I believe in healing. I play healing. I don't need to go into trance. I don't need to go into a special state. In fact, a lot of the people in, in my experiments are doing other things while they're t- treating cancerous mice. So they're re- some read books, some come to the lab with partners so they can sit there and talk about their day stuff, things that are interesting to them. They're not focused on the healing. You're not in a zone that is, I'm, I'm with the mice. So you're just letting healing happen. It's a natural phenomenon. This comes into setting the intention, mastering the cycling, so you're not having to think about it. You're just cycling. You're just playing cycling. tennis. And again, beyond what we're going to talk about today, I would like to just kind of summarize that you have data on using a healing technique that is unorthodox, non-conventional, calling it the Bankston Energy Healing Method at this point in time. And you've been able to cure mice. A part of the technique, there's a two-part. There's the image cycling technique, which to me, it's a for, it's a manifestation station technique. And then there's the healing part, which is the sending intention, starting off with an intention part. If I would sim- that's how I'm going to simplify it in my head. Anyhow, Bill, you may disagree. Go it ahead. It works. You- it works. Okay. The simplification okay. works. Okay. <laughs> We've talked about, you know, when you think about fertility and most people that are coming to healers, there, there could be this desperation. I need to be healed. Desperation. I need to have a baby. And so when we say it's playful, this idea of image cycling, and it would be fun, I'm not using that word loosely, opportunity to come together with people wanting to have a baby and teaching them the image cycling technique because in that teaching process they'll learn about keeping it playful and not taking it to so seriously so they may come in desperate and, and feel like they got to have this baby and I get that I understand that I, I work with women who are going through this on a daily basis so I understand that and can respect that and appreciate that and I think when you study with Bill you will be able to transform and have that shift where you want this baby and this image cycling and this manifestation technique is something that can be fun and you'll want to incorporate in all parts of your life, not just in your in your healing. Oh, absolutely. And as the baby grows up, you'll still be using it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Bill, I want to thank you very much for joining us here on the Conscious Fertility Podcast. I'd like to thank my listeners for tuning in. Check out the show notes for any links where we're directing you to more information on either Bill Banks and in his books and his workshops. Bill, I want to wish you well and thanks for uh, joining me for this interview. Thanks, Lloyd.